You are now locked into Radio Juxtapose, the home of contemporary art and culture conversation. Coming up today. Before street art, art was so, it was either so rarefied that no one understood it, you know, oh, what were all these bricks in the tape, that kind of thing. Or it was kind of impressions, well, I could never do that sort of thing, I can't draw. Because children are taught that they can't draw at a very early stage, and that, that, that stays with them forever. This is Radio Juxtapose. Okay, so we are once again back in the Radio Juxtapose hot seat. Another episode, another very interesting dynamic. Yeah. We're, we're sat in the, in the Ace Hotel in Shoreditch. At least yes. two-thirds of this podcast are in the Ace Hotel in yeah, Shoreditch. Yeah, we are. <laughs> we're in the, we've got the blinds down to block out the grey light of the skies above London. And that voice you can hear just now is the artist, the author, the silent member of Radiohead, the first guest, I believe, uh, that we've had on this podcast that's actually got a Grammy to their name. Shit, man, you have done your research. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's Stanley Donwood. Wait, and I'm actually lucky enough to be holding his new book. There will be no quiet. The reason we're doing this is partly a promoting promoting it. Should we get the hard promotion out? So I think we should start? really should do it. Buy, buy, buy my book. It's really good. And it's probably <laughs> quite reasonably priced. There you go. That there you was, go. That's it. So we can, we can forget about that now. That was the, that was the episode. <laughs> yeah. With regards to the book, look, I, I managed to pick up a copy this morning. It is absolutely gorgeous. It's really, that's content heavy. In an age of content, it is, that yeah. is a content as a, heavy. As a content provider, I thought I'd better do my best. So how many years of work is this slammed into 350 pages? Uh, I think it starts in about 1994. Something like that. 1994. It starts from a position of, of acute poverty and ends in an upper penthouse room in the Ace Hotel of London's Shoreditch. Oh, so it's a success story. It's a comp- I'm a god, you know. It's like the American dream, but only in Essex. <laughs> what I found, what, what initially jumped out at me is the you've got so much, like I say, so much imagery uh, you know, in collaboration, especially with the band Radiohead. Yeah. How do you pick, or how did you pick the image that you've chosen for the front of that one? Uh, for the what, front of the, the book. For the cover of the book. As a man that does the cover of albums, uh, how I, did you pick the cover of this particular by book? By completely abdicating responsibility. Because I didn't design the book. I've kind of done so much of that kind of graphic design sort of work. I was really pleased not to do it. So I worked with a a book designer um, who who lived in Barcelona. So I got to go to Barcelona to work on my book, which you can't imagine how half happy that made me as a sentence, be, just being able to say that. I'm going to Barcelona to work on my book. Imagine that. Yeah. Fantastic. Did, did you actually, so I did that. Did you get a sign that or did you just pick that? I kind of picked it, yeah. I said it, there was there was several different ideas for what the cover could be. And that that's um from a, a detail from a, painting done in about the year 2000 so I, I guess about the turn of the century you've done other books but this one is yeah. kind of the is this the first real comprehensive collection that you've put out yes is it i think it's the first one i've done that's uh uh looking uh more looking back rather than forward because i've always been slightly allergic to um I guess um, playing to my strengths. I'd rather attempt to do something that was a little bit more challenging. Whereas this is all—it's all work that I've done. So the the hardest thing to do really was to remember exactly what the fuck I've been doing for the last twenty odd years, which is really difficult because I haven't kept a diary or or anything. So the the way I had to work was by um, gathering together all my defunct digital media, which is, you know, um, Cyquest drives and uh, zip and jazz discs and drives and CDs and, and get, just getting everything together, together in the first place and putting it onto one, one um, I, you know, tr- trilobite. Tri- <laughs> what the fuck? A tr- a trilobite, <laughs> a is a, trilobite is a, is a fucking fossil. <laughs> you, what are they it's called? Those, membrane. those those things that terabyte. come above above megabytes, terabytes, terabyte, gigabyte, terabyte. something like that. I think they should be called trilobites, like those those sort of woodlice <laughs> creatures. 
<laughs> yeah, going, going from right back yeah, to, the, exactly. to the future. Yeah, exactly. So I bought, I bought a, a, a Trillabyte and I, I put all my data onto the Trillabyte. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, and then I could sort of assemble it by finding out what the, the metadata on the files were so I could kind of put them in some sort of order. How was it going back through 20 plus years of, of your history? How did you feel as you were doing that? Quite old, firstly. So if you look at an episode of Juxtapose from last year, it doesn't seem very long ago. But then if you look one for 10 years ago, it's suddenly a lot longer. And then, you know, when you start thinking about 20 years, you th- and then a quarter of a century, these, they start being, you know, th- we're moving into geological time. So it was, it was kind of weird to realize that I've just been doing this for, for so long. And, uh, and, and I've been getting things wrong continually in what respect because that's quite an interesting phrase that i i almost wouldn't have expected to hear coming out of uh, out of your mouth well no that was the, the working title for the book was um was a history of my disasters because the the, the one th- thing that unifies these sort of very disparate uh uses of different mediums and uh different sorts of of imagery because i've i've tried to be a different person every project that i do but the one thing that probably unifies them is the fact that they all almost all of them went badly wrong at some stage and i and had that whatever i thought was going to work has had to be abandoned and and worked on again in a different way do those mistakes and those kind of disasters does that mirror the experiences that you had with the band while they were making the music like was it is it are these disasters all in collaboration they happened while i was work often working in collaboration not not everything but i wouldn't say they happen uh in tandem with because you know the the band have their own various um, disasters um but usually they they have a disaster and i'm absolutely fine but i have a disaster and they're absolutely fine so we can't really share our misery what made now the right time to do this? Um, well, as I, as, as I say at the beginning of my reasonably priced book that should be available from all good bookstores, um, <laughs> that, that um, no, it was, the, in the introduction, I kind of sort of say that really it was the, the death of my mum that made me think about doing it in the first place because, I mean, I, I, was, I was kind of with her and she died and I thought, oh, so that's, that's that her her book of experiences she's not going to write anything another entry in her diary that's that's it that's over and you know she probably thinks i was only a little girl the other day and it it just made me think that i should probably make some sort of attempt to justify perhaps to myself but also to my own children what the hell it is i've been doing all this time you know why i had to keep going away and say oh, i'll be back tomorrow or that kind of thing so yeah, I was just trying to you know record what the hell I've been doing because I and also I guess I've had a kind of slightly interesting time, more interesting than some people, less interesting than others. Of these sort of languages that you communicate with, which do you find the easiest to do, text or or illustration? Which one do you feel that there's a comfort in? Because I was I really surprised know, yeah. that, as to how easily you would switch between. The, the more graphic element of communication into into text into the written word and they're, they're two very different practices yeah I, I think they are but they're also they're they're kind of a uh, complementary ways of expressing yourself I and mean, I formulated a really um, crap theory about how how art works a little while ago and I kind of imagine that the, maybe the the first um, art was was music was people making music singing you know, making a drum or, or banging things together, you know, rhythm. And that's the first thing. And, and, and music also, it affects people far more fundamentally than any other art form. You can be uh, moved to tears more quickly th- by music than, than anything else. It's a rare picture that makes you cry. So and then I thought, you know, I, fig- I figure the music's the most important art form. And then maybe drawing after that, because drawing is something that's universal and you can, you can sketch an idea for someone. Um, doesn't matter what language they speak or what era they come from whereas writing is much more specific writing um, is something that evolves arguably more quickly because it has to because of because speech 
um, evolves very quickly. You know, like you know, just um, mm. texting stuff. How we use how we use phones has evolved really quickly from that quick thumb stuff with all the abbreviations, and now there's like you emojis. know spell corrections <laughs> and emojis and yeah, I mean, so language is it's something that really interests me, and I think you can be very precise with 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 the information that you're trying to impart. And that with, with music and art, it's more vague, I, I think. Having done as much as output as you have, especially with regards to books and, 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 and text, um, what would you say is the, the biggest lesson that you've learned? Or what would you say to you know, a, a younger Stanley going in to write his first book? What's the biggest lesson? Fucking oh, get uh, train as a plumber. I think that's always a good idea. I would always recommend that young people train as a plumber or an electrician. Um, I get a trade, um, and then you can kind of do whatever you want because you know plumbers they do all right, man. They do. They do. They do great. You know, I, I, if I because I, I wanted to be a, a woodcutter, but that didn't work out because then I would have had a. A, a, a skill but unfortunately it you didn't worked happen. on a farm for a while didn't you? I worked on a farm for far too long how is that do you miss uh, do you miss that kind of do that, I that, miss that? the bucolic farm life do you miss the beautiful you and nature connected to fuck in? nature stupid <laughs> countryside no I mean no it's alright I mean it, um, I've uh, it was you know, I haven't worked on a farm for a long time mm. it's sort of a, those sort of jobs that they're unskilled and they just need people and yeah, it's it's uh, it's not a great way to make a living, and it's quite hard work. And it's and if I was still doing it now, I'd probably be in quite a bad physical condition, my arthritis and rheumatism and just everything. It's it's quite it's very hard work, and it's it's mad to think that's what that's what most of us were doing till till recently. Then the industrial revolution came, and we had to work in factories, even more dangerous and boring. And now we're all swanning around Shoreditch. Body making podcasts. But we're not. <laughs> just, just, just a very small proportion of the world's population are doing this. Most of them are still farming. Was working on the, was farming or working in different, like where did art school come in? Like what, and what was that time between art school and like maybe 1994 when this book starts? Like what were you doing? Oh, well that's, that's when I was, um, I was, try and well when this book starts it's kind of basically straight after i got uh i finished art college so i you know art college was a really was a revelation to me going as further education was was truly fantastic um i didn't appreciate it at the time because i was an arrogant little fucker so it's a it's a real shame because i could have really learned something instead of just being arrogant really afterwards it, it like many people from art college in that era, 25 years ago, um, it was straight on to unemployment benefit. I don't know what the American equivalent is. What do you, welfare? Or welfare. Something? Welfare? Yeah. Yeah, which was quite, you know, it wasn't a, very much money. In fact, it was hardly any. That That's what I did for a long time, trying to do artwork as well at the same time. So I was, I was you know, doing a, what's called street art back then, but, it, but then it was called vandalism. In fact, when, when I do it, it probably still is called vandalism because I, I lack the skills of a shepherd fairy, for example. Hello, shepherd, if you're listening. He will be. He will be. He's always listening. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he loves it. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> I'm going to go see his show around the corner in a bit. He was our second podcast guest. He was your second podcast. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, we came, we came in pretty hard on that one, actually. What do you feel about then about street art? Street, I Just love since, it. Since you mentioned it, because you know you you kind of going back and then seeing how it is. Well, Just now, where, where you do know, you that, sit with that's this? Kind of, I, this I've world? always had a real problem with with advertising because mm. it's it's everywhere, and some of it's really quite good. Apart from the bit where they try to sell you something, which ruins it. I mean, a lot, a lot of advertising, the, the imagery and the way it's put together is really clever. Graphically, it's brilliant, but then it's like, oh, for fuck's sake, a bank, really? You know. So I've always liked kind of the decoration of the urban realm, so to use a rather pompous phrase. And, and I, always, I was a, a very early fan of, of graffiti that uh, used to be in, in uh, before the advent of the, of the spray can, really, painted, painted graffiti with a brush. And I really liked that. There was a piece of graffiti outside uh, Paddington Railway Station in London where someone, well, I found out how they did it. They did it on a, 
Christmas Day, very early in the morning. But they painted in huge letters the long phrase, far away is close at hand in images of elsewhere, which is just beautiful. And it's sort of painted in like foot high letters on a long wall. And then eventually that, that was painted over by a, um, a spray, pa- spray can artist with, with uh, a very beautiful bit of typography that just said the word myth, which I thought was a brilliant rejoinder to that first statement. And now even myth has gone. It's been buffed. That's quite yeah. beautiful. Yeah. So, very and, poetic. Yeah, exactly. So There's I, such I, a I fine really line like, between that working and it not. I, yeah. I, I saw one the other day and it was, what if we woke up tomorrow and the world's music had ended? And I was just like, who who's taking away the music like yeah. nobody's threatening to do that <laughs> yeah. that's so this yeah. is a fantasy land yeah, that doesn't exactly. exist we've got far bigger things to worry about there might be no butterflies fuck fucking music there's always going to be music yeah, jesus it's like, this we'll, is... we'll be huddled in in the ruins we'll still be bashing rocks together in some sort of tune it's yeah. fine music is fine <laughs> is music fine How- how is, is music fine? Of course, yeah. music is great. I, w- I was interested, actually, and in just in that vein, because as someone who has kind of built a career creating some of the most, like I said, iconic album artwork of a generation, of two generations, the album artwork very was, kind of was you always to say so. so synonymous with the identity of the band and what to expect, things for you. Because I know, like, in the, for the Kid A album, you had, like, the booklet, the hidden booklet, within the album which nobody would ever find unless you smashed open the cd case are you still able to create these little easter eggs in a in a digital world or is that experience completely gone altogether there was a bit no no it's i think it's um even more so there's there's loads more things you can do that are, that are very interesting and i like what i mean the, the internet has made a lot of things possible i know it's changed how music is <sighs> the word consumed comes to mind. But um, I think it's also opened up lo- loads more possibilities. Uh, with, um, with with the last Radiohead record, with the, we, um, just out of, kind of by accident, I wanted to, to shut down the old sort of website that we had and put something new up. And um, well, what if we just like fade it, use a bit of code to fade it a little bit each day until it becomes white and then we start the new website and that was never intended to be a kind of way of marketing the record but it turned out to be because people thought what the fuck what the fuck radiohood are turning off their their social media there you know and it really it, it really did begin begin as an idea of how do we, how do we transition from one thing to the other and then we started off with the little animatronic Tweety Bird for that. Is it crazy, though, just even when you guys do something like that, that so many people pay attention and start doing, like, conspiracy theories, like, like right away? Fucking Reddit is brilliant, isn't it, for that? <laughs> it's great. I love it. I really, really think that I'm, I'm just so amazed that, that people are, are, are so sort of perspicacious. They just find these things. And I think we did... Something else. Oh, that's for Tom's last record for for Anima. We um we uh, wanted to sort of promote it, and this was a deliberate thing. So I kind of I did all these adverts for a uh, a company called Anima Technology, and they they'd made something called a dream camera. And you know you know when you wake up and you can't you you've got this sort of feeling you had I've had this amazing dream you know, and it's gone. Oh man, it was it was so good. But I can't, and you're kind of chasing its tail, but then the tail's gone. And I'm like, wouldn't it be amazing if the company, some kind of tech company, could photograph your dreams just at that point? It would be incredible. So we made all these adverts about this, and we put them up on the tube. We, put the, we took out adverts in things like the Texas, like, like the personals columns of, of like local newspapers in America. And, and, we, did, and we, we had a, fo- a fake website for Anima Technologies, we ha- and it had been closed down because obviously it's illegal to take photographs of people's dreams. The evasion of privacy is its horrendous. So th- it was been like a cease and desist. There was a very official looking government style seal on the website. This has been stopped. And then if you phoned the number, you'd get a very official answer phone message that we, we wrote in conjunction with, with uh, Beggar's Banquet legal department. So it was properly legal. This number has been taken down. You know, da, da, da. And we had it recorded in several different languages for different territories. 
And then we recorded all the messages that people left after the tone. And the tone was a few notes from the record. And this all worked really well. No one knew what the fuck it was for ages. But then someone on Reddit traced the code. There was some tiny fragment of code left from an earlier Beggar's Banquet website. And then this person was going, ah, Beggar's Banquet, Excel. Ah, ah, this is the kind of thing Tom York would do. And then, you know, then they figured it out. So it was a, wow. it was a, a proper detective story. <laughs> That's insane. I know. That is absolutely I know. It's fucking insane. Bonkers. Did you have any bands yourself that you loved that much when you were younger that you would sit if you if you could you would decode the projects they were working on to like backtrack to see if they made it? Like who was your band? Yeah, uh, good, good. That's a good point. But I I did you know I used to go to record shops and buy records purely on on the strength of the sleeve. So I was you know. I, and I discovered a lot of really music that I got so really into from from buying records on the strength of the sleeve. And, and like, so my first copy of of uh, Tubeway Army's um, record Replicas, I've still got it. And uh, you can sort of tilt it to the light, and you can see where I've kind of traced over the figure of Gary Newman. You know, I was I was obsessed by it. And they had the the London Underground sign, and I was like, what? And this thing they had a, they had a whole like language that he was he kind of created a world that I wanted to just find out about and the same with like two-tone records the specials and all that sort of thing there was it was sort of iconography and a kind of idea and just growing up in the suburbs in Essex I didn't really know anything about anything so it was all I kind of my cultural education came from popular media like records top of the pops that sort of thing and later on listening to John Peel and, and reading the enemy and things like that. What was access to culture like um, in the area that you grew up? Uh, quite minimal. <laughs> so how did you find your way into the record shops and into this, into this world? Well, in the, in the first instance, the, there was a, a, a sh the, we had uh, three TV channels and on one of them, on a Thursday night, there was a half hour show called Top of the Pops and they'd have the top 10 and, and they'd also have other stuff that was, you know, coming up, you know, up the, in, anything in the top 40. And so you'd see most of it was awful, but occasionally you'd see something great. And then on Saturday, I'd go down to the shop and spend 85 pence on a single. And that was, you know, my first single was, uh, I can't, was, maybe it was um, Our Friends Electric, Dear Tube by Army. A long time, you know, and, and uh, obviously then you get a single, and a single is there to promote a record, so... You have to save up from your paper round money and then buy the album. And so, you know, and then I, I joined the campaign for nuclear disarmament and I saw artwork done by Peter Kennard for, for mm -hmm. that, which was also like, whoa, photo montage. It, going into that then, what is your all-time favourite album artwork? Uh, I can, easy, easy. My favourite is... Um, it's called 20 Jazz Funk Greats by a band called Throbbing Gristle. I watched a video earlier because I, I was doing the research and I think you mentioned them before and I was like, that was crazy. It looked like everyone was on a lot of acid. I, I'm not sure if they were. They were, they were quite serious about their, about their uh, industrial art. And Gen Genesis, I'm not quite sure what or who he, he is now. Um, but the, the band Throbbing Gristle were, were fantastic. They treated music like an industrial product and they they lived in squats and they made they did gigs where people's ears were practically bleeding it, they were they were very avant-garde the real deal and the, and the, yeah and the, the cover for for uh, 20 jazz funk greats which is a brilliant title for that kind of a record of that sort <laughs> definitely you can slightly, imagine they were, slightly misleading well, exactly the record company the record shop staff would be putting it into fucking easy listening it would be great <laughs> So there, there's a picture of them on, on Beachy Head, which is the, the most famous suicide spot in yeah. the south of England. And they've got, they've got a 1970s Land Rover parked there. And they're all standing in the flowers on, on the, the, the grass, grassland on the top of the cliff. And Genesis has got this expression on his face, this kind of sick smile. It's just brilliant. It's a fantastic cover. How do you think things would have panned out if you had ended up intertwined with them instead of Radiohead? Oh <laughs> my god, I hadn't thought of that. I don't know. Wow. <laughs> Slightly shorter career. God. Oh yeah. I, yeah, I might be dead. No, they're okay. No, oh, I don't know. Yeah, hard to say. Hard to tell. Well, I was going to say that I, I forgot that you had got um, 
associated with like the early Lazaridis days. And it, this goes back a little bit to the street art thing. You had kind of shows intertwined with like those kind of big names of street art in London yeah. quite yeah. early on. How, like, how was yeah, well, that scene at the time? Uh, how was that? So that would be, I would wish I could give you a really great and entertaining, revealing answer. But um, I, unfortunately, I didn't live in London and I had kind of two small daughters. So I spent mu as much of my time with them as I could. So consequently, I didn't hang out um, doing acid or, or whatever with with the, the burgeoning street art movement. Because um, well, cause Bank Banksy had uh, the, his company pictures on walls round the corner from, from where, where myself and Doug are sitting now. Um, Scrutton Street, it was. Mm. And I, I went up and met with them um, about selling my screen prints through pictures on walls, which is what happened for a bit. And then Steve um, Lazaridis, who's, who's the guy that, that Banksy went to LA with for that show with the elephant, which kind of kicked everything off, really, in terms of street art being, uh, you know, in the public eye. Definitely. So, um, and I, you know, it it was that it was kind of exciting that this stuff that had been re treated as vandalism, even that amazing stuff that Henry Chalfont and Martha Cooper were photographing in New York, that was still treated as vandalism, which is fucking unbelievable. But yeah, so so somehow, I think because actually street art became monetized was the big thing. That, so it became respectable. It became a sort of form of art that um, can be taken seriously by almost the entire of the of the art world, such as it is. Did you feel an energy around that time, around what was happening with the spark of the rise of Banksy and see that kind of transition coming in? Did you feel that energy? Was it? Yeah. No. It was. It was really. It was kind of like. It felt like uh, almost art had finally been become something genuinely popular mm. because even even people like Andy Warhol even people like David Hockney these people who have been very very popular mm. it was art was still very much a niche interest for you the know? art was for the art for the world. art world you know but now like you know I, and, I, and I think you know uh, Banksy's um, publicity targeting things like the Daily Mail was was brilliant because now, you know, he can do anything. And, and the Daily Mail will cover it. The Daily Mail never used to have anything to do with people like us. It's, it's brilliant. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, done, it's made a huge difference. And when I, you know, when I was taking my kids, uh, like choosing, uh, like, which secondary school they go to, you go to these secondary schools, and, and like, the, the teenage kids are doing projects on Banksy. It's, like, it's fucking amazing. So street art talks to kids in a way that, you know, all those kind of paintings never did. Do you see that then? Do you see your 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 daughter's generation being more interested in in art where they possibly wouldn't have been? Uh, How maybe they well, the, now they're no, like no, twenty five, twenty five, and twenty two. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, yeah, they're quite. Your daughter's quite, daughters. Yes, <laughs> yeah, they're, 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 yeah. Um, but I think what it's done, it's just sort of opened a lot of doors that that. Uh, into the idea of what art could be and and an individual's um, feeling of their own potential to be able to do it because I think you know it, before street art art was was so it was either so rarefied that no one understood it you know oh what were all these bricks in the tape that kind of thing or it was kind of impressions well I could never do that sort of thing I can't draw because children are taught that they can't draw at a very early stage and that, that that stays with them forever, but then if if they can at least they if they can vandalize, and then if their vandalism is good enough, it's street art, and they're, then they're artists, which is fantastic. And then they end up doing talks in the tape. Exactly. Yeah. How does how does it feel to go from that sort of one end of the spectrum into the other end? Uh weird. Did you ever did you ever foresee that kind of validation coming out? I think if you just keep kind of plugging away at anything, the same thing for long enough, eventually you just become old. And if you'd been doing the same thing for ages, then you must be sort of respectable. So the key for this podcast is just keep it going, Evan. Keep plugging even away. Just, keep going. Even if it's just our mothers listening. Just, just work through everybody else's boredom. It's interesting the way you're talking about um, how we're kind of talking about how street art kind of made art more popular, but 
I even saw it too with juxtapose. It like allowed for people to start looking back at people who did poster arts, uh, underground comics. Like people started looking at alternative art histories and started validating that as well. So I thought like well, yeah, one, yeah. Of, one of Street Art's really great legacies is that it opened the doors for other outsider cultures to get shine, which I thought was interesting. And I think you're interested yeah. in that stuff as well. Yeah, well, I, one of the things that I, I discovered quite early on, because well, most children read read comics, you know, it's uh, uh, aimed at, at children. And and I I was a big fan of things like Asterix, um, you know, the, the French thing, and Tintin as well. And then I, I found some copies of uh, the fabulous furry Freak Brothers, when I was 11 or 12, and, I, and I, at the time, of course, I didn't understand all the, the drug references, which is, what did I think they were talking about? <laughs> you know, what, what is this? They must really like grass. Yeah. I mean, I like grass for playing on, but they like it a lot. <laughs> so anyway, so, and I really liked Gilbert Shelton's um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So And that led me into the whole Zap thing and Robert Crumb and Skip Williamson and on and on and on, all these, you know, the, these artists who who uh, I guess were that generation's street artists in a way, but they did never got the recognition until now. I mean, Robert Crumb is now, you know, he's, he's sort of viewed as a proper artist, you know? Yeah. Which is kind of, I don't know, is that, is that good? Because I, I liked his coffee table art book he did. R. Ah, Crumb's coffee table art book. It said, and on the cover it says, big, pretentious, expensive. It's fucking great. He never, oh, yeah, cha- he never changed, though. He got more famous and more uh, blue chip, but I think he's still the same guy. Yeah, he just kept plugging away, you know, kept doing until he was old <laughs> and respectable. Do you see your, any comic style in anything you do? Uh, well, I, I guess arguably the, the lino cut stuff that I do. The... Um, yeah. The the burning London. I've just started, I've just finished a book that's coming out next year, which I'm um, I should plug as well. My forthcoming book, Bad Island. Oh, I know it's really. And I was saying to Doug, I was working on three at the same time last year, which nearly killed me. So now they're all happening at the same time, which is doing something less painful, but still a little bit intense. I did 80, 80 lino cuts for for a book that's coming out in the spring. And that, that, because of the, the crudeness of how it's done, you know, you have a little pointy chisel and, and a piece of linoleum. So that's, that's probably where my sort of interest in graphic novels and comics, that's where it's ended up. Do you find it hard, having spanned as long as you have with Radiohead, do you find it hard to, to, uh, to create a distinction between you as the Radiohead artist and your own individual work? Uh, or are no. they just so both completely one, <laughs> it's, and, one it's and the all, same? It's, well, w- what usually happens with Radiohead is that I, I usually have a pretty firm idea of what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do that anyway, but I, I'm going to use their music and their their fame and their their massive public public adulation as a as a platform to just jerry my own stuff onto and kind of get this stuff because i want to get out there just you on the back of radiohead just use them as a kind of stepping stone but what usually happens is that whatever idea i've got i work on it and then I'm, i work with the with the band so i hear the music kind of being made uh you know composed developed produced all that sort of thing and and whatever I'm doing, it turns out to be not quite the right thing. So it, I kind of have like a germ of an idea, but it becomes something completely different by the time uh, it's finished. You know, so it's for effect, very much affected by the music. It's interesting that you say that because there is such a huge variety of imagery and textures that you create with regards to the Radiohead work. Yeah. So if you're switching between you know, filling syringes with molten wax to do one and then doing something which is more digitally generated landscapes. How How is it that you decide which path feels right in terms of actually the physicality of what you're using? Well, yeah, that's that's it. It's it's what, in a, in a way, uh, I kind of don't do that much because the, all the artwork is already inherent. It's already in the music. And I'm just sort of 
I'm just putting it down. So it's already there. It's just, and the difficult bit is finding a way into the music, finding out what it looks like. And once I know what the music looks like, it's easy. I just got to do it. And then, the, you know, the tools to do it become obvious and how to do it becomes obvious. But that, to get to that point, is the difficult, horrible bit. Right, because if you, if you come into, you know, a project where, you know, you have o okay computer visuals, but you get moon-shaped pool music, it wouldn't work. So it... No, it wouldn't work. You, no. you adjust no. a little bit or... I, I would have to, I'd have to junk all of the okay computer stuff, all that scratchy computer digital... I'd have to get rid of that and then do something else, but, which is what, what I've done before. I've I've gone quite a long way along the wrong, along the wrong path, a, a great effort and an expense sometimes, and then just gone. Oh no! So actually, you will find out if you buy my reasonably priced. <laughs> <laughs> I found it particularly interesting when I I looked back on your Grammy acceptance. And oh, geez, that's said, not on camera anyway, it is it? It said Stanley Donwood and Chalky. Yeah. Now, Chalky, I believe, is the name that Tom York uh, yeah. goes under, the pseudonym of Tom, Tom is, York. That is one of his many pseudonyms. Uh, goes under when he illustrates. If you were to join up with Tom for his next solo album, what would your pseudonym be? Oh, I quite like Zachariah Wildwood still, but I've used that before. That's a good name. Uh, I know, I found it on a gravestone in, a, in Yorkshire. Zachariah, Zachariah Wildwood. Wildwood. I know it was just a name on a stone. God, I bet he, I bet he was an accountant. I don't know. I've, I've got a, I got a few I could choose from. I haven't thought. I haven't got a new pseudonym recently. No, maybe I'll, I haven't. I don't know if I've used Danielle Chanel publicly. Perhaps not. Where's your sort of happy space for? creating then do you find you know i I've, I've read stories about you being out in say the cotswolds where you were really connected with nature and things does is that experience better for you in terms of your process and how you like to to make things or do you like chaos and more more of an urban landscape around you where's your happy place uh the, more the, the chaos and the urban I, th I think i find the countryside quite I mean, it looks nice and stuff, you know, but it's it's a very unsettling place. It's nice that they put it there for us. Yeah, it's nice. That it's good to go and visit and have a look at, but, you know, I'd like to go back to somewhere where there's actually shops and stuff. You know, it's, it's, trees are great, but, you know, there's a lot of them. So you need that kind of constant uh, stimulation going on around you? No, I, I like everything, to be honest. I've, I've just moved to, to a seaside town, and I, I've discovered that I love the sea. I, I really like the huge crashing waves and, and crazy weather from the sea, which I, I've, I've not lived by the sea before, but I really like it. Was it what pulled you there? I was just bored. Yeah, yeah. Bored. I think I had a midlife crisis. And so I wanted to, you know, I moved to a flat, moved to somewhere really urban and you know, so I'm a, well, my kids have left home. Well. Give us give us a heads up, just because me and Evan are sort of we're we're we're, we're not too far away from. Yeah, we're our working crisis. towards what's, a midlife what, crisis. Why are the telltale signs we should be watching out for? Uh, just if you feel a bit bored, you know, feel a bit bored and like, oh, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna be dead soon. That's if when you start thinking that, think, oh my god. Well, I was like, oh my god, I'm definitely more than halfway through my life, definitely. I've got to go and do something more fun. Okay, so you didn't you didn't get like a a, a drop top, you know, convertible. And no, well, then not being able to drive is be a bit of a problem with that. You know, I could buy a better bicycle, perhaps. <laughs> sort of with the little, yeah. Yeah. little engine. Yeah, a little go faster stripes on it. Doug, the, the sign of a midlife crisis is to work on three books at the same time. <laughs> oh yeah, maybe that's it. Yeah, just maybe desperately, just desperately trying to do as much work as I can before I lose my faculties. I think there's a lot in the understanding that your own mortality. Yeah, something that you yeah I think that's should it. put into question yeah when you start thinking about death a lot oh Jesus I'm in the middle of mind then yeah, I, can't, exactly. I, can't, I think about it yeah, permanent midlife crisis that's what we're all in it from the age of 10 onwards are you like on a book tour at the moment well that's uh, I, no I don't seem to be on a book tour they have put me in this hotel though the, the publishers and I, I've got another thing tomorrow night at the, at the Tate uh, bookshop there and then, uh, then I've got another. I've got an exhibition out. Oh yeah, I've got an exhibition next opening next Thursday over the road, there at Jealous Gallery. Um, what's the 
what's the sort of the the idea behind that it's called um arborealis the show which is i saw a word i made up which is a mixture of arboreal which is to do with trees and uh the aurora borealis which is a beautiful thing borealis was the god of the north wind i, I think so that's that's the sort of word for the show and it's it's all um prints that are to do with the natural world and its beauty the calmness the beauty of all those trees why have you gone for that i mean i feel like you're an artist who is influenced a lot by the external factors of the world we live in a in the western world we seem to be living in a relatively unstable uncertain political climate oh, i think it's a diplomatic and fair way that's to say very it. diplomatic no, it was yeah. quite quite good i'm trying oh. to i'm trying to i'm trying to appease yeah, uh, right. our listeners on both sides of the spectrum do you have you got li- listeners on both sides of the spectrum no, we don't. Yeah. actually i think we pretty much chased I, off I, all our right wing you, <laughs> right i think you they the might they may have gone elsewhere it's very nice of the liberal left to keep a little <laughs> gate open for them Hey, Ray, sister, all right, you can listen to us if you like. <laughs> we'll be diplomatic. We'll be diplomatic, but I think they've all fucked off, man. They're all, they're all on Breitbart anyway. Yeah, they've got, they've got they're better. Yeah, they're, they're not better. listening to radio, Jeff, I suppose. Yeah. They're on the up. Because you mentioned nature and, uh, and this. Yeah, I, I am sarcastic We're, about nature. I do, obviously, nature is very important, and I'm a big you know, I'm a big supporter of, of Extinction Rebellion. I'm a big supporter of the, the countryside, na- natural stuff, man. Yeah, yeah. I love it. It all grows by itself and all that kind of thing, unless we fuck it up too badly. But where you, has your work and your dialogue been influenced at all by the recent, um, the recent un- unsettling times? And if so, how? Well, yeah, I just did this book called Bad Island. I suppose there might be a kind of, even though it's nothing specific, about the islands of Britain. It is a kind of like a little idea about what being insular can do to to that insular state. It's it's much more it's le- less uh, didactic, less polemic and less um obvious than it could be, I suppose. But I, I don't uh that's another thing. As I've got older I feel less uh certain about anything. Which is not something you'd get certain older people saying. But I, I, mean, I wish I wish that would be great if Trump would say, you know what, I'm not actually sure about whether this is the right thing or not. Can I get some advice? It would be nice, wouldn't it? Imagine, oh, lovely little Trumpy doesn't know what to think. <laughs> oh, well. I don't think we're going to hear that sound. Not gonna, we're not going to see his soft side, are we? No. I guess that's a good way of, of approaching it, is that this uncertainty that everybody feels and this sort of kind of growing anxiety that people who care feel these days both in the United States and Britain, I guess it's it's almost better to make art that sort of captures that sort of uncertainty as opposed to like maybe being so uh, obvious. Yeah, I, I don't know. <clears throat> I can't speak for anyone else. I, I, I don't know if I'm right. I don't know if I think I am. But I'm, I'm sort of so bothered by people who are so certain about their rightness I don't want to be one of them. I, I, I've just read a book by a guy called James O'Brien called How to Be Right in a World Gone Wrong. And, and he's he's a a liberal talk show host, which is a rare thing. He really bugs the right. Yeah, have you read his yeah, book? No, well, I mean, I listened to it. I listened to right. him. I, 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 I just picked it up and I, I'd not heard of him. And it was really good because he, he does, he, you know, I agree with virtually everything he says. And he demolishes the arguments of of right-wing fuckwits really well and it's just i just don't feel that i'm i'm not i'm not a kind of debater or anything i don't really know how to how to take down someone's argument how to how to demolish it that's not it's not what i'm good at so i, I i'm not even going to try so uh, i'll just talk about the reasonable price of my my book <laughs> talk about the reasonable price of your book if you wait want. okay right. since we're we're plugging the book i think we plugged the book i think we have i think, we, we have I think we've plugged, plugged the, the fuck book. out of it i don't think we've ever plugged <laughs> yeah. a product as hard no, as no, we in fact this. i think i should say you, you do not have to buy it in fact i advise you not to buy it i think you should steal it what's your favorite what's your favorite little uh moment in the book uh, the end bit where I say that's the end yeah that was my favourite bit to write you know got like yeah, a favourite little thank the fuck sort of for that. take from, from no, the no 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 I really like the, the little bit the little hangman that says finished at the end that's, that's <laughs> is that how you yeah, felt that's, at the time I put that at the end of all my books now that, that little hangman yeah. you've made it this far yes well yes, done no, now I feel like killing myself 
Oh, well, we can't end on that. Come on, Stanley. You've got, you've got down a little bit. Well, after, I think, you know, ah, you know, well, the winter's coming. It's, it's going to be a nice snow and everything. It's going to be lovely. Okay. Lovely um, Christmas. I, I, I guess I could finish on something a little bit more positive. Nuclear I, war. Um, do you... Apocalypse. What kind of uh, new devices and tools are you playing with um, to create? Because obviously you kind of come from maybe a generation of scissors and glue. You've you've slipped into the de- generation of of, of a more digital practice as things are starting to contain or continuing to develop. What what is it that is exciting you in, in ways to create and in uh, um, and yeah ways well, to create? To be honest, I'm really looking forward to painting some big pictures again because I haven't done that for a long time because I've been doing lots of other things. But I really I, I've got a new studio and I I need to need to get working i really want to do that and, and cyanotypes i've got to get going with some chemicals you know cyanotypes it's like a type of photography and you can paint this uh this chemical onto anything cellulose based so cardboard wood paper cloth and then expose things onto it photographically so i really want to do that and i really want to paint some big pictures but the first thing i've got to do I'm, I'm illustrating, this is crazy, right? This, this is the opposite of street art. I'm illustrating the poems of Thomas Hardy. Okay. I know, wow. for the Folio Society. So uh, what I'm doing is getting a bus pass for Dorset, which is basically Wessex. And uh, he wrote books about, actually, yeah, juxtaposed Thomas Hardy. I'm not sure who's going to know about this. He's a kind of old dead poet, right? And I, I don't even know anything about poetry. Not so, to be confused not, with, uh, with Tom Hardy Tom of, Hardy. Uh, oh, of fame. fame. <laughs> yeah, of fame types. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thomas Hardy. Old we have a very guy. literary audience. Died in about 1920-something. He wrote Jude the Obscure, and it was so savaged by the critics that he gave up writing novels and wrote only poetry. So uh, what I'm going to do is get a bus pass and travel around the, the area of southern Britain he wrote about and take photographs of of uh, modern scenes of poverty and render those in a Victorian style for this for this thing well I think that's so what what's, the, what's the style this what's is, this what's this te- uh, technique that you you, I'll, you just I'll mentioned do, it didn't you oh these, these will be look like Victorian engravings so I'll do those as, as etchings so you get a, a metal plate and you draw on it mm-hmm. with, with a Sty- a harder metal stylus so I'll do these really detailed pictures in a very Victorian style at least that's the idea that I'm starting with. It will probably be probably end up completely differently to that. What was it that triggered that this idea for you to want to go around and explore this this kind of poverty in Britain, modern poverty? Well, this was what what the poet Thomas Hardy, not Tom Hardy of Tom Hardy fame, but Thomas Hardy of no fame, was uh, that he was very interested in ru- the rural poverty of of the late 19th century and the early 20th century. He was very interested in. In, in how the lives of the of the rural poor played out, and they are very overlooked. Somewhere like, like the the main part of the Wessex, which is this sort of semi-fictional land that he wrote about, was Dorset, and Dorset is is known for being quite posh, really. You know, it's a lot of rich people, but there's also a lot of very hidden rural poverty. Same as in Cornwall, Devon. You know, a lot of places that are often. The peop- they're where people go on holiday they have a lot of national trust properties they're quite you know bucolic leafy countryside sort of places but hidden in that is is a lot of poverty so you reference something like that when you were doing the when you were in the Cotswolds doing was it Kedi? yes probably and yeah you had you had mentioned that it was all it's like yeah <laughs> some, some kind of 1950s idea of yeah. the countryside that sort of UKIP this- Britain it is funny how you have this idea of Englishness and exactly like you say. It's kind all of sort of chocolate it. boxes and ladybird books and things like that. Cups of tea and yeah, all God, the fucking vicars. Uh, finger sandwiches. That, that's how it is, right? That's, that's how, it how it is. is. Yes, 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 yes. That's how it is. Do you see a lot of similar threads then between the two? The description of Tom Hardy and Thomas Hardy. Tom, not Tom Hardy. We're not, not, we're, we're not that. Hardy. I'm not that close with him. Oh, jeez. No, no, no. Good old Tom. He's good though, isn't he? It's great. Yeah. Um, do you see lots of similar threads between the two structures of poverty and the, the, well, the it's experience kind of like for those people? What he did back then, you know, like a hundred years ago. So Thomas Hardy's books, his novels and his poetry would have been, this was before the age of paperbacks. So these would have been quite expensive. So in those days, the sort of his, his buying public would have been 
the comparatively wealthy and the wealthy. So the people he was writing about would never have read his work, or they might have had it read to them, or it may have been serialised in magazines, but a lot of the poor then couldn't read anyway. They couldn't read or write. Mm. So there was no sort of universal education. So th again, he, so he was using uh, the sort of <sighs> the, the mediums enjoyed by the wealthy to try to illuminate the lives of the poor with some so there would be some concern so something might be done about it so there would be a movement towards some kind of equality it's funny how you describe that as they didn't really have access to this type of culture but i guess probably the biggest difference is that even if it is through a digital experience there's still no matter who you are you have access to that type of to, you could access poetry, it doesn't matter. Yes. All you need is a smartphone yes, and an absolutely. internet connection. Yeah. Yeah. You can access things yes. that you wouldn't have been able to access before. Yeah. So that's probably going to be one of the biggest differences between those two. Yeah, yeah, two between the times, yeah. But I mean, I don't know that it's not like equality has got the, it's not got any better. <laughs> no. And I think that's that all of the, all of the work that was, that was done by a lot of kind of wealthy people on the left wing that brought about things like the National Health Service and the idea of a welfare state and, and libraries and universal education, all that sort of thing. All of those things happen. And all of those things are now being demolished and replaced by nothing at all. But, you know, as you say, we, we have digital technology, but, but it's, it's kind of a completely uncurated and now people get their news through Facebook and, and the algorithms that run what they see are reinforced by seeing more of the same kind of thing. So people end up getting more and more polarised rather than brought together. And that's the role, maybe the role of the artist in there somewhere to try and bridge that gap. Yeah, that's that. we could say that. That would be quite cheery. Oh, so, did you see where I was then, going? Did yeah. you see where I was a, going a with that? A little happy moment. <laughs> <laughs> I can see the little bunnies on the oh, on the grass covered slopes right now. Yeah. Little happy bunnies. <laughs> <laughs>